Good morning and welcome to CASAS. We're so glad you're here. We're in the final week of our Generation series and we hope baby boomers enjoyed hearing the Beatles and the fun trivia moment last week. We all have different perspectives, life experiences, and wisdom to share. This series will continue to highlight the uniqueness we all bring. It also allows us the opportunity to learn more about what it means to be part of a multi-generational church and the gifts we all contribute to this community. Today is Mother's Day, and we'd like to recognize moms for all their hard work to support their families and kids no matter what. As a special treat for Mother's Day, we have free coffee available in our coffee spot for moms. If you don't drink coffee, we have tea available as well. We hope you enjoy your day and feel loved and appreciated. Our ministry theme since August has been Better Together, and to celebrate the closing of this ministry year, all Better Together merchandise is buy one get one free in the Welcome Center for the entire month of May. This will allow us to make room for our new designs launching this summer. If you are a high school student, including our incoming freshmen and our graduating seniors, you do not want to miss the best week of summer vacation. This year, we are going to California. We will stay in university dorms, visit the beach, go to a water park, compete in high energy games, and so much more. It's going to be a lot of fun and a great way to connect with others. To register, visit our website and you can find summer camp information and registration on the high school ministry page via Kids and Students. If it's your first visit with us today, we are so glad you're here. We ask that you text the word guest to the number below because we'd love the opportunity to connect with you. Also, if you haven't yet, be sure to stop by our Welcome Center. We have a small gift for you and we'd like to meet you. Whether you're joining us in person or online, we're glad you're with us. Thanks for joining us today and welcome home. Good morning. Nice to see you guys. As some of you guys are coming in and making your way to sit down, uh, allow me just to be one of the first people to wish everyone happy Mother's Day, all the moms in the room, right? Happy Mother's Day to you all. You're going to hear that a lot of times today. It's good to have you here. You know, we're still in the middle of generations. In fact, in fact, we close that out this week. Today's the last day of the generation series. As part of this series, we wanted to have a lot of fun with that each week and just have some fun with different generations. We've started every week with a song. And I want to say really clearly so that you know, not a worship song. So don't stand up and start singing worship to the Beatles or anything like last week, right? So we're going to sing Today is for Gen X. How many Xers in the room? Yes? There's a, some subdued clap. Actually, some very excited clapping for Xers, which is, yeah, great. Um, so if you are a part of Gen X, uh, this song is for you. Hopefully you can guess it. We're going to go on a little journey uh, here together. And I hope, uh, hope this one blesses you guys and that you have a lot of fun with it. So our band's going to lead us out. if you're clapping. Okay, here we go. Just a small town girl living in a lonely world. She took the midnight train going anywhere. Just a
to our extra friends. There you go. Well, for all of us, uh, we're gonna stand, um, maybe turn, find someone around you, say hi, meet somebody new, tell them if you were a Journey fan or not, if you like that. <laughs> and we're gonna jump into worship here in just a second. out together. I remember the moment he told me I'm free from my past. Now all that I know is I'm never turning back. Sing it out. I remember the moment he told me I'm free from my past. Now all that
Go ahead and have a seat for just a moment. Uh, We wanted to acknowledge that it is Mother's Day and actually do something special here. There's a couple of moms that, uh, with great courage, because they don't do this all the time, they don't get in front of you all, uh, are willing to come out here and let me ask them a couple of questions. It's about what it's like to be a mom and and some of those types of things. And so will you welcome them uh, with encouragement? This is Georgette, Tammy, and Grace. Thank you guys for being willing to, to talk with us. And uh, the hope would just be that this is a blessing. You know, as we're in the midst of a generation series of three moms from three different generations, um, and there's a lot, of, a lot of differences, right, in parenting, but there's also a lot of really beautiful commonalities in motherhood, and so I hope you get to see uh, some of that here. Um, but the very first one, so if, uh, the first question I'd love to ask you guys is, if your kids are anything like I was growing up, like they don't always do what you wanted them to do. In fact, sometimes they probably even need to like be corrected a little bit, right? <laughs> or maybe there's discipline or a privilege or something like that. So for you as a mom, what's the one privilege that you're like, this is the one I take away? So I just have a one-year-old daughter, so there's not a ton of privileges that can be taken away from her at the moment. But the main one that we constantly have to take away is free roam of the house, free roam of any of any space, being able to get into any cabinet or um, yeah drawer that she wants to get into that that gets taken away often. Yeah, you're all about containment. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Grace is tired. <laughs> that's what, that's what the, I remember that era of, of parenting for sure. What about you? So I really couldn't remember this one, so I had to ask my kids about it because I thought it would be different for all three of them. And all three of them came back saying that I would ground them from spending time with their friends. When they were younger, they might not could go to a birthday party or have a sleepover. And as they were older, it would be like a dance or a football game or something. Right. So it took you a long time to remember that. Or you had a hard time remembering it. How, how easy was it for them to remember? Oh, immediately. They all came <laughs> back. I was like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, you should ask that today. See if, see if mom remembers. Um, when uh, my kids were little, I um, used a wooden spoon. I didn't want to send them to their room because everything's there. So I'm getting applause. <laughs> So later on, as my son got older, I found a shirt. (laughs) (laughs) And he actually wears, has worn it. And people look at it and go, what the heck does that mean? So he does his explaining. But he also said that the way my husband and I raised both our kids, that it has made him better children today are grown-ups and um, stronger, and they are thankful for uh, that. How many of you want that shirt, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. I know, I told my mom, she was in the last service, and she was like, oh, please don't embarrass me, please don't embarrass me. So, um, okay, so that's the, the privilege you'd take away. What, the next question, one of the things that I think is really fascinating is uh, we will hear when we're planning a, like a Mother's Day moment in a service, every single year somebody will be like, oh, you should have done this. This is how you should bless a mother. Or you should have done this. This is how you should bless a mother. Over the years, what I've realized is, oh my goodness, there's like so many different perceptions and perspectives on what actually is blessing and what's actually refreshing. And so I wonder if each of you guys could take just a moment. What would bless you on, on Mother's Day? So my ideal is like time alone and time with family. So probably like a brunch together with the family first and, and time together and then getting the rest of the day by myself, nobody bothering me with the book. Right, because you have little ones and you're like, I need to be alone sometimes. Yes. Yeah. Well, for me, because of my kids' age and my grandkids' age, I think I would like to do something outside like an adventure, like a hike or go tubing or paddle boarding or something. So get really active. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. okay. Being a mom, I just like my kids around me. So having my family together and um, just spending the day talking, sharing, laughing, that's what it would mean for me. I love that. So do you guys see how different that is? Like you could celebrate one and completely miss the other. Challenge for all of us is maybe ask, right? Like maybe actually ask the person in your life, what would actually bless you uh, versus maybe this prescription that we handed you of what to do here today? Because I think there's such a diversity of answers. You might be surprised what you learn. Uh, Now, one of the commonalities amongst all the different generations is uh, that there's a thing where I think every parent and every mom in particular has something that they want to 
pass down or instill in their kids about what parenthood looks like, right? Like whether it's just through you as a mom or your example, what is that thing for you where you find yourself going like, I, I wanna pass this down or I want them to see this about parenthood with me? For me, it's just that I'm not perfect. I don't have all the answers and I don't expect my child to be perfect and I'll love them and, and be there for them regardless. Love that. Um, I would just want them to be present with their kids and make the time that they spend with them a priority. When my oldest was born, I saw a quote that said, the nights are long, but the years are short. And that really stuck with me. And it seems like a very simple thing to do, but in this world, it's really hard to it stay hard. present. Yeah. yeah, that's really important. For me, it's unconditional love. I want my, I have already, <laughs> my kids are grown, um, that they can understand that no matter what life gives them or is dealt, that they can come to me unconditionally and talk about it, we'll work it out, and just love them up. And I have something I'd like to share with all moms this morning. The human body can only handle 45 units of pain, but at the time of childbirth, a woman has a maximum of 57 units of pain which is equivalent to breaking 20 bones at a time. Never tell a woman she can't do it. Remember that only she can dance with two hearts and breathe with four lungs. Only she could carry the weight of two worlds in her belly and let life be born in her. <clears throat> Ladies, thank you for being willing to get up in front of all of us and be honest and answer questions. Can we give them a round of applause? Thank you very much. No matter what generation you're a part of, uh, as a mother, for all the moms in the room, I just want you to know we love you, uh, and as best as we possibly can, we see you. I know that for some there's great joy in this day, I know that for some there's complexity in this day, and, but just through it all, may you know that you are loved, valued, and appreciated, and we are so glad that you're even here joining us uh, this morning, whether you're online, in person, either way. Happy Mother's Day. I would love to uh, pray, uh, just a prayer blessing for all the moms in the room if you'd join me. God, we come before you and I just uh, come before you and ask God that you would bless uh, each of the mothers in this room. I pray that they know how loved they are, first and foremost by you, but also by, by those of us in this church, by the people whose lives they impact so dearly, and that they wouldn't just know that in their heads, but that it'd make its way to their hearts, God, that they would just resound with that here today. Lord, I pray your peace in their lives. I pray quiet in their spirits today. I pray that you would strengthen them uh, that you would give them perseverance, that you would continue to grant them wisdom with full eyes open, that they might see the good and the blessing and the beautiful things that you have for them. And Lord, as a church, help us to continue to know what it is to love them uh, in a way that comes alongside, in a way that stands behind and continues to walk, uh, walk forward, Lord, as you guide us, Lord. We just trust all of this to you. And thank you so much. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Will you stand and continue to sing with us? Never know love like
there's a simplicity, humility to the way you love me, in honesty, a purity. God, you make it easy. No special words, or formulas could ever win you over. For your love is undeserved. Even when I can't see clearly, somehow you still make it easy. Your love's uncomplicated. You love me just the way I am. So I stand. Totally surrendered with open hands and open heart. Jesus, have your way in me. Ooh, uh, ooh, uh, Jesus, have your way in me. My brokenness. Secrets you see, my deepest thoughts, my hidden ones. God, you see right through me, even when I'm overthinking. Somehow, you still love me simply. Your love's uncomplicated. You love me just the way. It never grows old How could I tell you enough That I love you, I love you, Lord I could sing over and over I love you, it never grows
It never grows old How could I tell you enough That I love you, I love you So right now, we're going to enter into a time of giving. You know, a church is a really amazing place in that all the different people who make up a church really are, are what make all this happen. Right now, there's volunteers all over this campus doing amazing things. There's ministry that's happening not just on a Sunday, but throughout the week, around the world. And all of that is because people give their time, their energy, their finances in a really extraordinary way. And so I just want to say thank you for being the amazing church that you are. You know, there's a couple different ways that you can give. Uh, there's boxes near every door that you can, uh, if you want to give in person, you can go online on the website and make that happen. You can even mail in. So whatever way works best for you, that's amazing. Uh, but just continue to, to be the incredible church that you are and just know how thankful we all are for you. Um, each week, as we have been in the midst of this generation series, we've tried to have a little fun with like, I don't know what you would call it. Like, do you remember these products or these moments or this thing? And so we started with millennials. We did boomers last week. And Gen X, today's your day. So boomers, you'll probably know what most of this stuff is because you probably bought it for somebody at some point in time. But Xers, this was probably like a part of your life at some moment. It's really fun as I've been talking with different millennials and Gen Z people over the morning, and they're like, I've like heard that name, but I have no idea what that stuff is. And so I think like you should bring some of this back and some of it should be left behind forever, in case you're curious. So um, see, if you can, see if you can remember or identify this very first one. You wanna go ahead and put it up there for me? Jello pudding pops. Any remember? Jello is an invasive species that started with the boomers making its way into Midwestern salads. And then they decided they need to make their way into the freezer section as well for the extra generation. How many of you guys like Jell-O pudding pops? Like you remember these? You did. I can't handle it. I'm going to be real honest with you. I had a lot of these. I used to buy them from the ice cream man. There's something about it melting in your mouth and turning the texture of lard because it's pudding. It's not like a thing that melts away, like just coats your mouth with brown, which nobody wants ever. So it's just weird. Um, but I don't think they exist anymore. Has, any, has anybody had one in like recent time here? Anybody? No? They're gone? All right. Well, like may they rest in peace. I hope they never come back. <laughs> Jello pudding pops. That's wonderful. All right. The very next one uh, is the clapper. Count of three. Ready? One, two, three. <laughs> All right. You can turn them back on. They did that to me this morning, and I was like, does that really work? Is this how this place works? Because <laughs> that happened. The clapper. How many of you actually owned a clapper? Anybody? No? How many of you, like, knew somebody who owned a clapper? At the very least, how many saw the infomercials constantly? Yes, exactly. Let me give you a Gen X tidbit here. This is a thing that will help you in your life, and it all stems from the clapper. If you have a significant person in your life that you sleep next to who happens to snore, Use the clapper technique. It's the best. In the middle of the night, if they're like sawing logs, all you have to do is the same exact thing you just did. We all know how to do it. You just go really quick. That will buy you five minutes of time while they're figuring out what just happened so that you can slowly make your way back to sleep. And if for some reason they catch that moment, just say, think Gen X and roll over. Like, it'll be great. I promise you. It's God's gift, the clapper. The other piece that's weird with this is in my house now, I have Amazon Alexa and that's supposed to be like an upgrade from this whole thing. But I can't tell you how many times I'm like, Alexa, turn off the lights. And it all of a sudden... Sorry, I'm having trouble understanding right now. Yeah, I think this was easier. Like, I just think that's the, the, the easier thing. So I don't know. Have we really moved forward? Maybe not. So the next one here, how many of you... Anybody own one of these? Has anybody gotten it to grow? So I've owned three of these, and I just stare at weird gelatinous seeds that like harden and get really gross. Like it looks like a leprosy pet is the thing that I end up owning. It's really gross. But for those of you that weren't a part of this generation, apparently people at one point liked to grow hair on their pets that was actually, I don't even understand. I'm not going to lie and pretend like I do. But you can still buy these in like the specialty section at Walmart or Walgreens or wherever. So, uh... Give that. That'll be the gift that keeps on giving. Every mom wants one of those this year, guys. 
It's a big deal. So grab one today. Make sure you give somebody and bless them. All right, the next one, MTV. Yeah, there you go. Everybody's clapping. Gen X was famously called the MTV generation, right? Because video really did kill the radio star. That was the very first video ever, music video. If you're a part of a younger generation, you think of MTV as like just regular programming. But for Xers, MTV was constant music videos playing all day. It was actually all music. If you were an Xer who grew up in a conservative Christian household, you weren't allowed to watch it anyway, so it didn't matter, right? That is true. Uh, And so, yeah, MTV, which was a a, a huge thing. And then my personal favorite is this last one. Anybody learn to spell with a speak and spell, this demonic device? Anybody? What I don't understand about this device is why they chose the recording to be some crazy demonic alien voice as opposed to just somebody saying A-E-I-O-U, like a nice voice. Whenever you would push the letters, this thing would teach you to spell. Every time you'd push a letter, it would say it, and then it would spell back the thing. But in this horrible voice, it would be like A-E-I-O, like really intense, and it's awful. I think it's possessed. And... E.T. used it, so that's kind of cool. Um, I don't think they exist anymore. They're probably a collector's item. If you still have one, I don't know what you should do with it. Have fun. Put it as your answering machine. Prank call people. Nobody has an answering machine. I don't even know what I'm talking about right now. <laughs> right? So that's it. If you're part of Gen X, hopefully some of those moments made you reminisce a little bit. I bet you there's a product or something like that where you're like, oh, you should have done this. If we ever do something like this again, Give us feedback. We'd love to hear what some of those things are. It was a lot of fun. We had a lot of fun with this. So today, uh, we're going to close out the Generation Series. Jen is going to, er, Jen, Glenn. Call him Jen. It'll be really fun. <laughs> Glenn is going to make his way out in just a moment. And I hope this series has been a blessing for us as a church. And above all, we just hope that it brings us together to create space for each generation. Because we're so glad that all of you are here. Well, hello, my name's Jen. Great to meet you. <laughs> uh, Ryan was having a great time. Well, this has been a fun series, and I, and I hope it's uh, something that's been uh, helpful as you're relating to other people uh, in your own generation, other generations. Um, I, I know that when uh, they started the song, uh, you know, Don't Stop Believing in the, the the first service, I didn't know they were doing that song. And then I heard it, I was like, whoa, whoa, what's going on? So this last, I had to actually come out and just be a part of it out here uh, for this service. But um, uh, yeah, this looking at, at generations, there's, there's something that's fascinating about it. And I hope that as you go through it, like you start begin seeing those differences, but appreciating some of the uniquenesses and letting it be something that actually fosters greater community. You know, as we've gone through this series each week, uh, we have looked at something different that is an issue that, that wants to create more division between uh, the generations. Uh, the first week, we looked at this idea of like older and younger generations and, and where the divide gets pulled in, where like older generations uh, can uh, kind of mourn or focus on what gets lost and younger generations can focus uh, more on what's like standing in the way. And the second week, uh, we looked at uh, this idea of understanding because if we don't understand some of the uniquenesses in other generations, then it's, it's like we can't appreciate the gift that they are. Um, it gets hard to relate with them and that begins kind of deepening this generational divide. And this morning, I want to talk about a place. And what I mean by that is uh, generations can struggle to have what feels like a place in the world or that sense of belonging. And when we struggle with that sense of, of belonging or having a place and it becomes more generational, like you see this divide get deeper and deeper and deeper. And there is a, a trend uh, that is driving this even more uh, today that I want to look at. It's, it's a trend that's really driven by technology that just kind of keeps fueling the, the issue a little bit. But that's not to say that technology is bad. Like when we think about technology, there's a lot of good things about technology um, in how it connects us. Uh, for instance, um, getting to just go online to take care of most of the stuff you need to take care of with the DMV, 
is a wonderful thing, right? To not have to go to the DMV. Uh, if I didn't ever have to go again, like that would really be okay. I'm sure uh, that with uh, things happening with like telehealth, that I bet there's some things that are really good that are coming out of that. There may be some challenges because there's this thing where technology is not good or bad. It's, it's just, it's how it's, get, how it's used, uh, what we do with it in all of this. Social media, you know, we give social media a bad rap on a regular basis, uh, it, but there's also a side of social media where just connecting with old friends, uh, staying connected to other people, new friends or whatever, like there's a part of that that is also good and wonderful. But what I want to point out this morning is uh, there's a negative side of what happens with this kind of technology of being connected. And here's the trend that is happening in our world. And it's this, hyper-connectivity is increasing our virtual interface while diminishing our face-to-face -face relationships. We're getting more connection in, in a kind of interface where we can connect with people, but there's something happening with that where is that's going up and that's not necessarily a bad thing, but the bad thing is that there's this kind of face-to-face -face relationship that's getting diminished more. And you see our whole world uh, struggling with this in different ways. They've done uh, a lot of research on this, this kind of general sense of loneliness that becomes more pervasive is climbing worldwide, climbing more in countries that have more technology. Uh, one of those countries is Australia. Uh, it is the highest tied with, uh, and this is at 34% of the general population, tied with, guess what other country? Us, no, the US. We, like, like we're up there. And if so, if you have felt this, it's because it's this trend that is happening. The other thing that is interesting is that it's not hitting every generation equally. It's hitting every generation, but the younger you are, uh, right? If you're in a younger generation, it, it is hitting those younger generations um, even harder. Uh, there was a survey that really surprised me. Uh, so as they go through the survey, they're asked this question, and they do this with all generations, but this is with Gen Z, uh, asked the question, I feel loved and supported by others close to me. Only 33% of Gen Zs that were surveyed said that they, that they feel loved by those close to them. The other question was, someone believes in me. Only 32% of Gen Z said, I, like, I, I feel like there's somebody in my life close to me that believes in me. Now, I want you to compare this, though, to the connectivity of this generation, because this generation has massive connectivity. Um, when it comes to being connected in some way with events worldwide or caring about them, 77% of Gen Z uh, like are connected in some way. And the other one that I think is mind-blowing is... Uh, it, when asked, feel connected to people around the world. And, the, and when you look at the survey, it's not just abstract people. It's actual people. They know their name. 57% um, of Gen Z have some sort of connection with an actual person they're interacting with somewhere out in the world around there. Lots of connectivity. But the loneliness factor, like that face-to-face, -face, like I... It's one thing to be connected to someone. It's another thing to say, I have a place, because to have a place is to belong. And what we're losing is this sense of belonging. And the more we lose that sense of belonging, right, it will create this kind of loneliness that's isolating. And is that happens, it, it's going to be across the board, but it will also have this effect of isolating generations more and more and more, because you can't just have this loneliness factor going up more and more and more without every generation feeling it, without it dividing those generations in there. And here's the part that becomes important to us, um, and it's this, too often churches um, end up, and religion of, of all sorts, end up accidentally becoming a part of deepening that gap, that generational gap over loneliness and belonging uh, without realizing it. And it's because there's this uh, kind of pattern 
uh, that churches or religion can get pulled into. And it's this pattern of understanding that, that pulls us into it. So I, so I want to talk about this pattern um, just a little bit here. Um, it's a kind of religious norm that ends up translating into a relational norm. And here's the pattern. Here's this kind of religious pattern. When it comes to, ha- to having a place, when you think about like spiritual things, religious things, there's this pattern where the person who is lonely, the person who is the outsider, the person who has sin, the person uh, who is seeking God always does work first like, and takes a step or movement towards that God or gods. And I'm, and I'm going to relate this to like world religions here for just a moment. And then the work done to provide a place, whether that's through like redemption or forgiveness or taking care of them in some way, is then done by that God or gods in there. And so the norm is uh, we as people, if we're struggling over something, we make the first move. We do the work and then, right, on the spiritual side, God does his work. You see this uh, all over. Uh, An example of this, my daughter and I uh, recently uh, got to do like a a father-daughter little adventure trip uh, into Mexico and we went and explored all of these Mayan ruins and I learned so much about these Mayan temples that I never knew before and they were walking through this how they would build these uh, temples over time and all the work that they were doing because they were like trying to appease the gods uh, like the corn god they like if we don't do these things then the corn god's not going to produce corn for us what shocked me was these huge temples, when they finished building them, they would time it so that like their calendar would come to an end and then they would start a new calendar. And I'm like, okay, like I've started a new calendar, right? But when they did that, it was time to build a whole new temple. And, he, and so the guy's saying, underneath these temples, a lot of these temples, we're now discovering there's other temples because they just, because there was always something you had to do before that God would do something for you. You know, this is, we also see this in the Old Testament. We see this with the Mosaic law that the early Israelites followed. Like, um, if you needed God to do something, there were rituals, routines, things that you uh, did. If you uh, did something wrong, if you sinned and you needed forgiveness, then you had to prepare a sacrifice. And there are all these things that you followed. And then you would take it to the, the temple and the priest would do his job. And then God would do his work to uh, forgive you in that. And there were all these other things. The pattern is, we do something, and then God does his work, right, hopefully, to take care of that thing that we care about. And, and this happens because, right, uh, the human spirit needs to belong. The human spirit needs to know, how do I know I belong? And so when you look at all these ancient religions, they're answering that question. This is what religion has done for millennia. Do this, and then God or the gods do their work so that you can have a place. Now, I say all of this because, right, and you're saying, okay, I get all the the religious things and all that stuff, but there's a part of this that we then take on, and, and if we play this out relationally, this is where it becomes this kind of unhealthy thing. It, it means that every generation, to apply this to generations, feels this burden of like, okay, what is it that we have to do or be? And then those other generations do the work to provide us a place. And we see this because accidentally we can begin to see God this way. And so we begin living it out uh, relationally and theologically. But here's what I want you to know, and uh, we're going to look at this passage. This is part of what Jesus breaks. This is part of what Jesus takes and he reverses it or he upends this uh, in in a in a really powerful way because it's kind of like he would look at it and see that we do to generations what religion has done to people all along, right? And if we want to be this church that has this calling, remember last week I talked about how Paul. Uh, says from prison, he says to all, you know, to the church in Ephesus, he's just like, listen, live up to your calling, right? And the church has a different kind of calling than a religious calling. We don't often think of it that way, but, but Christ is 
upending all of these things. And I want to look at this. So if you have your Bibles, turn to 1 John, right? This is the, uh, the letter, 1 John. Way back in the back of your uh, Bible, there's three short letters uh, written by John, 1st, 2nd, 3rd John. Um, you know, and if you're a millennial or a Gen Zer and you've pulled out your phone, it, you just, you know, it just goes right there. You don't have to know where in the Bible it is. And I go to the back. So, <clears throat> but we Xers and boomers, we're catching on. We're more of us are using our phones for our Bibles these days. Okay. First John, first John chapter four, uh, he says this, and I want, I want you to catch how he upends this. He says, this is love. This is love, not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Now, at first glance, we look at this and go, well, yeah, I've known that forever. That's great. That's wonderful. But I want you to just think about this for a moment as you think about this norm of how all the religious world has worked. Every major religion that I can think of has worked this way. You do something and then God or the gods do their work. And Jesus is saying, you know, however that was, that's not how I work. That's what John is explaining. He says, he loves us. He goes and he does the work before we've done anything anything. This is the great reversal of what happens in Christianity, right? It, it front loads the, the, the very beginning with all the work that God does before we do a thing. This is amazing. It creates something totally different in a relationship with God, and it should create something totally different in the culture and the atmosphere and and then the relational generational interaction within churches uh, in this. Um, Because there's this tendency in us to like hold back, to to wait, to to feel like uh, I need to do my thing and then I've got to wait on God to do his work. We don't often think of this idea that like Jesus has already done the work in this. Um, Let me illustrate it in this way. Uh, This past uh, weekend, uh, my son graduated uh, with his master's, and so we went up to celebrate. Grandparents went up there. He had a bunch of his roommates and friends that were up there, and uh, we, uh, we decided we we're going to throw a party at his house to celebrate. So we loaded up the ice chests and all of this stuff, and we caravaned up there, and we went through his graduation, and we come back. And of course, as we, we get to uh, his house, uh, one of his roommates, uh, his parents, uh, own this house, and so they pay rent to him, and they own this. So it's this wonderful house, and we get there, and his roommates come out. Most of his roommates I have known now for like close to six years, because from when he first started college and was going through all of this stuff, uh, he has roommates that were there his freshman year, and like there's hugs and high fives, and it's just this wonderful time, and you know, we're loading out all the ice chests, uh, but he has one new roommate uh, that he's only known for a little while that I really hadn't met yet. And so I'm getting to meet this guy for the first time and I'm excited and he's watching all of us and you know, there's, you know, everything going on and you know, we're just taking over the whole house, you know, I, and I literally, right? And to celebrate, we're like, and, and we're gonna treat you guys to steak. So we got a steak for everyone, right? So I'm firing up the grill and I'm going around, you know, and I'm asking how they want their steak done and Angie is cooking and my dad and Carol Ann, they're cooking and Angie's dad I mean, we just, we literally took over the place. And I get to his new roommate and I'm like, so how do you want your steak done? And he goes, oh, that's so nice, but I'm okay. Don't worry about it. I, I don't need one. Right? And I was like, oh, no, no, no. We brought plenty. I promise you. Right? Because we've got grandparents involved. Right? And they like, yeah, I'm telling you, we've got plenty. He goes, oh, no, no, no. I'm okay. Don't, don't worry about it. You know, it's just, and, and I watched him just kind of slip back. And it, and have you ever been in a moment where like, you, like, it just feels like, okay, they're probably saying this to be polite, but I really don't have the place to like partake in this. Right? Because I don't know all the stories. I'm the new person. I, I, I haven't done the work in this and everyone brought food and I didn't bring anything, right? You just, you can feel him. Like, it's just like, I, I've not, I don't deserve this, right? You all are really nice and it was nice of you to offer, but it would be nice of me to decline because that would be like the appropriate thing to do. And I'm like, no, give like, what do you want? You know, and he's like, and I could tell it's just like he didn't know what to, and he's being a little overpowered as we like took everything on. And, and you could just 
feel like there was, a, there was a social norm playing out that we've all felt. Maybe you've been on the other side of it. Maybe you were on the side of it that I was on, like a moment where there was someone that you re- like, and, and we already planned. We shopped ahead of time to prepare stuff because we knew he lived there and we were planning on this uh, for him, right? But like he just, like you could tell he was pulling back in that moment. Ever try to convince someone? They're like, no, no, I promise. This is for you. And you can tell they just like are shy about it or don't feel like they deserved it yet. See, sometimes that can happen in generational ways. Sometimes that can happen where it's just like, it, we just feel like, no, like, I, like that's nice, but I, I, I haven't earned that yet. And what you need to remember is, we are a part of a spiritual tradition. I'm not even gonna call it a religion, because in so many ways, I think Jesus undid religion. He, like, he upended all of these norms and he established something new. He was not waiting for the work that we would do. And then he'd go, well, you know, you seem sincere enough now. You seem like you're going to really try and pull your life together. I tell you what, I'll go ahead and do the work on the cross to forgive you. That's not how it works. Um, there's another New Testament uh, author, uh, Paul, who talks about this over in Romans chapter 5. Let me, I want to read this to you uh, Real quick, Romans chapter five, this is in verse eight, if you wanna follow along. He says this, but God demonstrates his own love for us in this, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us, right? Like, it's the same kind of thing. It's this front-loaded thing where Jesus goes out and he does the work before, before we even existed at this point, right? In fact, when you look at the tense of this, it's fascinating to me. Uh, uh, Paul writes this, he says, right, there's this thing that he, that he loves us and he demonstrates for us, right? It's being demonstrated for us. What tense is that in? The present. Right now, there's something that is demonstrating God's love to all of us in here. Presently, all of us can say, you know what? I know God loves me because it's, I'm ex- there's something demonstrated for me right now in this moment. That's true of every single one of us. And what is it? Well, it's that Christ died for you and I. And what tense is that in? The past. He did the work before. It's done. And it continues to be the demonstration of his love now. I, I, friends, that like in religious circles, that's just heresy. Like it's just that God does his work for us first, right? God's not asking us to earn salvation, earn relationship. Our, our job is accepting what he has already done for us. This is the beauty of of life with Christ, friends. But here's why this is important uh, for us when, it, when we think about generations, is because there's this thing where we all, we, we always want, we, we hold back from it. It's like, really? Like I, but we, we come up with the exceptions. It's nice of you to say, you know, maybe next time or whatever. But you know, Jesus doesn't treat what he did on the cross in the same way. In fact, what I, and the reason I wanted to go to Romans here is because of how, it's like Paul anticipates us going, oh yeah, 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 but I still need to do something, right? To prove how much I'll be a good Christian for you. And then he's like, no, look, look at the next verse. Look at verse nine. He just, he's reiterating the same thing with greater and greater intensity. Verse nine, he says, since we have been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him. Like, okay, so let's say, you know, it's not just saving it. Like, you're worried about God's wrath, right? And gosh, man, if you knew my past, you knew I like, I'm worried about God's wrath. He says, don't be. Even God's wrath, because what Jesus did before takes care of even God's wrath in this thing, right? But let's say you're still like, oh, I'm still nervous. Look, look at the next verse. I love this. For if while, if, right? If, if for while, we were God's enemies, right? Not just that God's just like, okay, now, boy, I, I don't like what, the way you've lived. I don't like, I'm upset with you. That's no, you were like God's enemy, right? You were against God. No problem, because Jesus did the work before. 
even if you were his enemy. That's amazing to me. That, that just upends everything religious. It should change the way we relate as a church and see ourselves in this, right? There is a beautiful pattern here in what this is all about. Something was already done for you. It was uh, really interesting as um, I talked with Chandler's new roommate and like I, you know, I asked him about the stakes a couple of times and he's, you know, and he just kept declining or whatever. And then I noticed like Angie, uh, had talked with him about like desserts because we had brought these different, and he's like, oh no, no, that's just, you know, that's it. And then, then I saw him, he got into the refrigerator and pulled out some leftovers and heated them up and out in, in the microwave. At that point, then I came over and I said, so here's the deal. Um, if you don't tell me what kind of steak you want, I'm going to make you three. I'm gonna make a rare, medium well and well done steak. And he's like, no, I don't know. Okay, but just know I'm making it for you, right? Because uh, we like, we already got him. We brought him and just, and I did. I made him three steaks. I just, like, we grilled them all up and I made sure there was one of each for him. I watched my dad and Carol Ann and they, they were making like this, um, like um, spinach dip and like, and they were offering it to him. Like everyone in that whole house was trying, pushing food his way and asking him to be a part. And anytime he'd want to drift off, someone was like, kept pulling him into this thing because like, there's this different thing. It's just like, we're not worried about what you have to offer. This is a party and we're celebrating and we would just love to have you be a part of it. And the last thing we were worried about was, well, has he done anything to deserve this? No. And Jesus, Jesus isn't looking at you and saying, okay, like, you know, you know, what have you done for me lately? And it's no, he did the work because he loved you. He made a place and now, it's just a matter of whether or not you'll accept it, if you'll step into it, see? This is such a different way of thinking. So when it comes to providing a place for people, young, old, generations, different, we, you, you pick the difference. Churches should be unlike any other organization in the entire world where we're making places for people before they get there because that's what was done for us, see? So now I want you to think about this when it comes to generations. And, and what I want to do is um, I want to offer like just two dreams, two things that, that, that I want to call us to and then follow up each of those with a, just a kind of challenge for how we live this out. And the first one is this. Um, no generation comes into this community needing to prove itself to have a place. Don't you want to be that kind of church? No generation. Yeah, and there's, gonna, there's more and more generations come. No generation needs to do anything to prove itself to have a place here in this church, right? That, we want to live by that. So let me make a challenge to our older generations. And, and I will include my generation in, that, in this. I'll be, I'll be a part of this, okay? So I, so I say this to me and, and mine as well in this. Um, here's the challenge for us in the older generations. We must take this on as a mindset. We must take it on as a mindset that, that no generation needs to do anything to have their place. They just, we provide a place for them in this. And, and maybe that means that we have to let go of some labels, that we don't make some assumptions, that we make room for different ideas uh, uh, in all of this. But we take on a mindset that we live out uh, that is, they just have a place here. They have a place here. They, they are us. They are family in this. Um, let me say this to the younger uh, generations here. Uh, first, this, you have a place here. You have a place here. Um, and I'll follow up with this challenge. Um, there's a difference between having a place and having your way. And, and I don't mean this like in any sort of snotty way or anything like this, but to be multi-generational, because that's our value. It's, it's, we never think of this as binary, which generation gets its way, right? What it ultimately becomes is everything becomes a, a, a kind of, of 
bending and molding and compromising and including. And it's, it's not binary. It's not that I do or don't get my way. It's that how do I help us have our way? All generations getting to have a way in this because we come to this uh, together. And so when I say that to you in younger generations, we want your voice we want your voice, and, and your voice is going to create big change at times, and there's going to be pushback on it at other times, but we want your voice, and you have a place for that. We want you volunteering and participating and being a part of this, like, because you have a place here, and this has been our history. I was thinking about this uh, just uh, here in the last uh, day or so. You know, uh, I, I've been a part of Casas for a really long time, right? Good going way back. And uh, those of you who go back with this church way, way back, you will remember we were a bit more traditional at one time, right? Um, let me just remind you, there, there was a time when on the platform, there, there would have been no secular songs. One, we had no instruments on the platform that you could have played a secular song with at that point, because we only had two instruments. And the edgy, crazy, rocking instrument was a piano. And then the other one was a organ, right? That's the instruments we had, right? Um, and uh, it was backed up by a great big choir every Sunday wearing choir robes. How many of you were around and remember the choir? Okay, so a few. Remember what color they were? That well, we had the, the bright blue ones with the fluorescent gold glow-in-the-dark collars. Remember those goldish yellow collars, right? Yeah. We've moved a little bit since then, haven't we? And you know how we moved on that? There was this young, full of energy, sometimes brash, filled with vigor and energy and idealism generation. This young, young generation that we now call Boomers, yeah. I remember when the boomers were young and in this church, and you know what the boomers in this church wanted to do? Change the music a little bit. And they did. <laughs> they, and, and I remember those early days of the music around here changing and worship changing and all the things that were happening. And you know, that creates a little bit of tension at times. I remember the senior pastor before me, uh, and still a dear, dear friend of mine. In fact, I was talking to him on the phone just uh, a week or two uh, ago, Roger Barrier. And I remember when Roger was introducing uh, uh, all of this and helping us navigate what it meant to be a multi-generational church. And one night uh, we had worship music that was led by a band, okay? We didn't dare do it on a Sunday morning yet. Um, we did it on a Sunday night. In fact, we didn't even start on a Sunday night. We actually started, we rented a, uh, a school on like a Wednesday night, the very first time. I mean, let's get it away from the church, but we'll have church people playing the music, but it won't be at the church. And just, you got to introduce some of this stuff kind of slow sometimes, okay? Um, but I remember it was a Sunday night and uh, we had, it was uh, maybe the first time we had drums on the platform with it, an electric guitar. And Roger joked, somewhat joking. <laughs> uh, and his suggestion was, maybe the first time we won't plug in the electric guitar. <laughs> yeah, that, that's true. Let's just see how that goes. <laughs> and then maybe we'll get around to plugging in the electric guitar, right? Um, and now I look back and I just laugh. But there's this beautiful thing that, you know, that we got to change. And, and that new young generation a place was made for them. And they changed this church. And they, right, they got to have voice. They got to have place. And, and we've continued to be a, a church that says, and we're going to keep on making a place for the next generation and the generation uh, after this. Um, we do this. We do this because this leads to the second thing here that um, I want to talk about that we want to be. We do this because of this. We want every generation to have a place in shaping who we are as a church, because that's what it means to really be multi-generational, to, to, to let generations find that voice. And this is hard, okay? Let me tell you, this is hard. 
because it always means sacrifice. It means, sometimes it means sacrifice on the form of things. Sometimes it means sacrifice in how uh, we come at different issues. What are the most important theological things? What are the least important theological things? How do we view those things? How will we practice this? It just gets into all of this stuff. But to stay vibrant, to stay alive, you have to wrestle with those things. You, you can't just let them stay in place. And it's letting the different generations feel that they are having an impact on what the church is becoming that makes it our church, all generations, having that place. And it takes this. It takes a lot of love, but of a certain kind of love uh, in this. And, and, and I want to point something out uh, again here where Jesus upends the whole religious understanding of how this works uh, in this. You know, in the religious uh, uh, world, uh, when it comes to love, it's like, okay, God loves us, therefore we need to love God. And we play that out in all of our relationships. Okay, someone loved me and I will love that person, right? You love someone who loves uh, you in this. But I want you to see where Jesus takes this. Uh, flip back to 1 John. 1 John chapter 4, just right where we were before. Look at verse 10. He says this, This is love. Not that we loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. All, right? all that stuff I was talking about. He does all that work, right? Front, uh, uh, just loads up the front end of all of this work. But now here's how we live this out. Look at what he says in verse 11. This is, the, this is amazing. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love God back? No. What does he say? We ought to love one another. Again, this, this is describing the heart of Jesus. This is, this is, like, this isn't just, this isn't how the world works. Okay, I'll love the person who loves me. You give me something, I'll give you something back. And what God says, you know how I want it to work? I'm going to love you but I want you to love somebody else. That's how I want this to work. See, if we want to be a multi-generational church, we don't love other generations so that they'll love us back. We just love other generations because we know how much God loves us, see? And that, that it creates a different spirit. It does something unique. It does something powerful. You know, as uh, the steaks were rolling off the grill and the, um, you know, the cake is coming out and the chips and the hors d'oeuvres and stuff are, are coming out, I, I watched something uh, happen that was uh, really cool. There, there was one moment where uh, my dad and Carol Ann were over by the spinach dip and uh, Chandler's roommates, you know, they would come by and of course, um, you know, my dad and Carol, they just can't help but just include people in everything. That's just, and if you know my dad, this, you just know this is how he is. And, uh, what, and Chandler's new roommate kind of walks by, and my dad's just, you know, asking him questions about, you know, have you ever had spinach dip? And, just, and you can tell the guy's just like, spinach dip? Like, spinach is terrible. Like, why would you ever make dip out of it? Like, you, you don't make hors d'oeuvres out of bad tasting stuff. My dad's like, oh, no, this is good. This is just, this is, and see, you take the bread like this, and just, <laughs> I'm watching my dad just pull him in. He's going to get some food in his mouth here in a second. I'm just, I'm just, Sure enough, he did, right? He did, and I'm like, yes, right? And all of a sudden I realized it's like this poor guy in a beautiful way. He's got Carol Ann is pulling him in. My dad's pulling him in. Angie's dad's pulling him in. Uh, Chandler's other roommates are pulling him in. Angie's pulling him in. Like he didn't have a chance. Eventually by the end of the night, that guy had a plate of food and was having a good time and eating with us in that thing. And it just, but it was like the coming together and it's just, and it just kept on happening because, right, he kept reading that vibe that was going on in this place. They said, we're not expecting anything. We pulled all of this together because there's just something beautiful happening and we're wanting to celebrate. And we thought of you, right? We brought enough food for you before we ever showed up at this house. What would it be like if churches, right, said, we don't even know what the next generation is. And I don't know what, I don't know what they're going to call. I know they're probably born already. I don't know what they're going to be called. But I know they're going to have a place at this church because we want to make a place for them. 
We're gonna love them in a way that will let them know that they have a place in this church because that is the kind of love that we have experienced from Christ. Being different than the world on this is the thing we wanna be different in because we have Jesus who has modeled this kind of difference that we see in all of this, right? This is the beautiful thing about being the church and if there's ever been a time when the world needs this, it's now, right? We want to be a multi-generational church out of this. And it will be hard. It will be challenging uh, at times. Maybe you grew up with conditional love and that whole thing about I love you, you know, you love me, so I'll love you back. And maybe that's all you knew growing up. Break the cycle. Break the cycle. Break the cycle here in your church. Let something new flow in and through you in this. Um, maybe, uh, you know, there's a moment where there's something that feels uneasy. You feel a change uh, uh, happening in this Step into it. Step into the change. Maybe there's something that you see and you don't understand, well, you know, why have they been doing this for all of these years around here? Step into the conversation. Ask, understand, and then like take part in, in, in shaping it. But it is as we come together and we dive into scripture and we understand what the Bible is saying, as we volunteer together to serve one another, as we come together to serve the larger community around us, as we come to worship and follow and use Jesus as our model for life, right? We will pull the generations together, right? That is the reason we did this series, is to come to the place where we could be in a room like this and look around and see people of all different generations and feel something richer and truer than if we were only with those that were of only our generation. That's what makes the church beautiful, friends. And that's what you're a part of. Keep it going. Why don't you stand? And I'm going to close us in prayer here this morning. And I just, uh, just want to thank all of you for being a part of this series and the way you've been living this out uh, already. Let me, I'm going to pray and close us here in a moment. And as I do, I'm going to be hanging out over here. And I would love to just shake your hand, get to know you. If you're new, come by and see me. Um, I, I don't have any spinach dip to give you right now. But if I did, it would be yours, okay? Uh, let me pray. Let me pray, we'll, and we'll be dismissed. Father, we just lift up all the moms in here um, and all the, all the women that have taken on uh, the, just the role of motherhood uh, for someone around them. And we just, we are so grateful for all of those women that, have, that are moms and have stepped into that and what that means, because they have also made the world a better place. And we pray that this would be a morning that you bless them. And Father, we pray that we would just continue to be a community of people that are seeing the beauty of who your son is and that we're becoming more and more like him. And we pray this in your son's name. Amen. Have a great morning. See you next week.